In our study of advanced differential calculus, we were talking about this thing called the total differential. If we have a certain function z is equal to f in terms of x and y, if we can write delta z in a certain form, we say that the function has a total differential. Now this total differential is quite important because it's really a step forward to say that I have a certain function and now I want to alter both x and y simultaneously. We can change delta x and delta y simultaneously. So for today's lesson, we're going to talk about a theorem which is quite common in advanced differential calculus that concerns the total differential. Okay, let's see what we have. So previously, we say that for a certain function, okay, the function that we gave as an example is z is equal to x squared plus xy plus xy squared. Now, then what I can do from here is that I can write delta z. So I can analyze a change in z and it's given by this expression over here. How do I get that? It's very easy. Delta z is given by the function applied to x plus delta x, uh, y plus delta y minus the function applied to x and y, where x and y is a certain point. Okay, this is very easy to see. You just, you know, think about it geometrically. It's just we concerning two points. We're going to apply the function to the two points, take the difference. That gives me delta z. And this is what we have over here. This very long expression over here. Now, I just want to comment a bit. We say that delta z is a linear function of delta x and delta y. Again, saying that these two um, functions over here that are really the, the terms or the coefficients of delta x and delta y are independent of delta x and delta y. Okay, because x and y start out as a fixed point and plus all these terms over here. Now, this seems very confusing to you, you know, includes uh, terms of delta x, delta y raised to a high degree, such as delta x squared, delta y squared, but I can rearrange that to a very nice form indeed, okay? Now, we see the delta x squared over here, the delta x squared, I will factor out the delta x. So what I will have is that I will have delta x multiplied by open bracket 1 plus delta y and that over there, sorry, uh, plus delta x squared, uh, delta x, yeah, so we multiply this inside, we get delta x squared. Similarly, I can also do the same for delta y, okay, we can see there's a delta y over here and a delta y over here, I'll factorize out the delta y, so what I'll ultimately get is that I will get a delta y x, okay, plus, and then I'll finish factor one out, I get this over here, okay. So, why do I want to do that? Because now, magically, it takes that certain form we were all talking about, the form that the function needs to take if the function is to have a total differential. Is this form over here. Delta z is equal to a delta x plus b delta y plus epsilon 1 uh, delta x plus epsilon 2 delta x, where the limit of epsilon 1 as delta x and delta y approaches 0, and same for epsilon 2 is equal to 0. Now, just look at this, okay, this is a function which is independent of delta x and delta y. This goes into A over here, and this function uh, independent of delta x and delta y goes into B, and epsilon 1 can be functions of delta x and delta y. They are indeed functions of delta x and delta y. Not only that, if delta x and delta y approaches 0, we can see that these terms cancel out, and yes, it is true that epsilon 1, epsilon 2 does approach 0. So, this function takes this form over here, and yes, the total differential exists. So, using this as a background for our theorem, why do we want to have a certain theorem concerning the total differential? Okay, remember we say that when delta x and delta y are sufficiently small, okay, I can cancel out this and I can say that delta x is approximately equals to dz, where this dz really describes the total differential. Okay, so really, this total differential is quite important because I can just write the whole function into this large expression over here, never mind about this epsilon 1, epsilon 2, because when I let delta x and delta y be sufficiently small, what is left is the total differential. And here is the theorem. The theorem says that if z is equal to the function x and y has a total differential at this point x and y over here, okay, if the total differential exists, then two things happen. f is continuous at x, y, and this is the more important part. A is equal to partial z, partial x, and B is equal to partial z, partial y. Why is this very important? Because now, straight from the function, okay, straight from this function over here, we can immediately calculate the total differential by taking partial derivatives of this function over there. See, partial z, partial x, partial z, partial y, this A and B goes into this over here, which gives us the total derivative. I'm sorry, the total differential, the z. Okay, so we just want to prove that, and actually, um, it's quite easy. Now, the last remark is that the, the differential, when it exists, is unique, okay? Uh, basically, it comes from this form over here. We can show that it's actually unique, but let's, uh, never mind about that. So, how do we prove this result, okay? Which kind of looks fundamental, but let's just prove it. First, what we do is that we set delta y is equal to 0, okay? Now, when this happens, notice that 
um, I can use already this form of the total differential, okay? Oh, sorry, I can use this form of delta z. Now, remember, the theorem says that the condition, if the function itself has a total differential, okay? So, if it has a total differential, that means this immediately is applied, obviously, with this condition taking as the limit because that's the definition of the total differential. But if I set delta y equals to zero, I'm left with delta z is equals to a delta x plus epsilon one delta x. Okay, basically the terms involving delta y cancels out because I'm setting delta y is equal to zero. Now, from here, what I'll do is that I will divide out, okay, the delta x. So I've got delta z, delta x is equals to a plus epsilon one. And after that, I'll just take the limit of both sides as delta x tends towards zero, okay? And magically, or very easily, what I get is that um, a is a function independent of delta x and delta y. Remember, I keep on stressing that a is a function of x and y, not of delta x, delta y. So this becomes a itself, okay? But when I take the limit as delta x tends towards zero, epsilon one tends towards zero over here. Now both delta x and delta y is now equal to zero. So this gets cancelled out over here. So all I left with is a. But what does a equal to? The limit as delta x tends towards zero of this function over here is none other than the partial derivative. Okay, there we go. We got the first one over here, and similarly, you can do for this one over here. Substitute partial x, partial z, partial x inside a over here, and we get the total uh, differential. Okay. Now, not only that, implicit in the theorem, we can also say that the function f is continuous. Okay? The function f is continuous. Now, this is very easy to prove, as always. Okay, remember. If it has a total differential, okay, we are able to write this statement over here and we know that the delta z is equal to zero when delta x and delta y tends, uh, tends towards zero, okay, we also know that. So basically writing that statement over here, um, delta z is equal to the function x plus delta x, y plus delta y, subtract the function um, x, y, okay, and what I just simply do now is that I take the limits of both sides as delta x tends towards zero and as delta y tends towards zero, likewise over here. A delta x tends towards zero, delta y tends towards zero. Now what happens to the left hand side? Basically, there's no change in x, there's no change in y, there's no change in z. So this is equal to zero over here. Now after do, I do that, I can just simply bring this um, function, the function applied to x and y, which is our first starting point, to this side over here. So I'll get the function x, y, okay, I'll minus this off, and then you can see this is actually the definition to say that the function f is continuous, okay, it's just another way of saying that really as these two variables approach a certain point, okay, the point that approaches actually x and y, if you can see that delta x that L delta y tends towards zero, the approach to actually x and y is equal to the function applied to the point itself. So yes, this one says that f is continuous, okay, and finally, this is, I want to say this again, okay, the existence of partial derivatives is not, I repeat, is not sufficient to guarantee the existence of the total differential, okay, which is dz, only the continuity of the partial derivatives is sufficient, okay, we shall look at it at a certain example, okay, and uh, to show what does this mean. Now, I want to say, be clear in these terms. Down here, I'm saying that the function f is continuous. So the function here is continuous over here. But what this is telling me is that the partial derivatives themselves need to be continuous. If the partial derivatives are continuous, that means the total differential exists. And if the total differential exists, the function f is continuous, okay? The existence of the total differential uh, conditions to show that evolves the partial derivatives. But once we have the total differential, I know that the function f is continuous, okay? This is what analysis, you know, involves using all these precise definitions and really we're going to see how we can apply this to certain problems. Okay, thanks.